friends, the angels have a very clear message for you this month, and it's this. Do not hold the vibration of fear. Hold the vibration of love. Do not hold the vibration of hate. Hold the vibration of peace. I wanted to let you know that we'll be praying more together here on this podcast. In my lifetime, I've witnessed personally miracles that occur when people come together and use their free will to pray. The angels say it shifts energy, creates an opening for healing, and brings positive change. Please join me at the end of today's episode and every episode this month to pray for and envision peace on earth. We'll also be praying together over on my Instagram page if you want to join us at Angel Podcast. Now here's today's episode. Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome back to the Angels and Awakening podcast. I'm your host and author, Julie Jancis. And friends, today is the day I have been raving about over on social media and the angel membership here on the podcast, uh, Dr. Lisa Miller, because I've read her books, The Awakened Brain, The Spiritual Child. These are two books that you must have. If I had any on my bookshelf right behind me, these are the first two that I would recommend. Um, and why is because as a spiritual healer, and there's so many healers that listen to this podcast, so many people who are doing spiritual work themselves, I feel like the book, The Awakened Brain, is really the anthem to why it is that we do what we do. Because uh, you could really go through The Awakened Brain, and I actually want to do this. I want to go through it again, and I want to create a one-page sheet that talks about fact after fact after fact after fact of when you have spirituality in your life, you have all of these incredible benefits. And it's not just us saying it from doing the work, living the work, um, teaching the work. It's, it's backed up now through 25 years of Dr. Lisa Miller's research. So Dr. Lisa Miller, thank you so incredibly much for taking time out of your day um, to be here with us. Oh, Julie, it is such a joy to share the science of spirituality with you. And I want to recognize, applaud, thank you for your leadership in this field and supporting women and men, but many, many women in our natural spiritual birthright. I really want to thank you for taking a lead and helping the field grow, helping women grow, and helping the bonds between women grow. Oh, Dr. Miller, you're going to make me cry. Um, thank you. Um, that means a lot to me. Your work, your book starts off with you are in the, the psych ward, working in the psych ward of a hospital. You're working in there for over a decade. You're working with people who are struggling with big challenges and coming up against big things in their life. And you're seeing some people make these huge strides and get better. And you're seeing that some people keep coming in every couple of years and they're not getting better. So you start to ask yourself the question, why? Why is it that some people are getting better and why is it that some are not? And in your book, you start out saying um, what you found is that a mother who is spiritual and imparts that spiritual wisdom to her child and who is also affectionate really changes um, that child, that child has less depression, less anxiety, less substance abuse in their adult years. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, you know, so that really is perhaps one of the most important findings in science that you know, we know first and foremost that every tiny little baby on day one in our lives is born a physical being, an emotional and cognitive being, and we are born spiritual beings. We know this as a scientific fact, and we know this through the method of twin studies. We look at twins raised together, twins raised apart, 
factor out their commonality as a function of genes and environment. And it turns out that we're all born with what might be called a spiritual core, right? But that muscle can strengthen or that muscle can atrophy depending on our environment. So we are born spiritual beings, but our mother, our grandparents, our, our father in some cases, our pastor, priest, Ahmad, our teacher, the 10,000 exchanges by the locker, all way into shape our environment on our deep spiritual core. And there is no one who has a greater impact or told another way, the most important impact for most young children is our mother. And there is a, if you were to imagine a, a beautiful braid, a three threads of a braid of a mother's pure love, our pure unconditional love. And as a mother, we know, I mean, there is nothing we, that will stop us from loving our children that, you know, no matter what, I mean, you know, when they're tiny, they, you know, mama, what is that horrible bump on your face? Oh, honey, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know they, they spill all over the place. Oh, darling. You know, I mean, we love them so much. And our pure unconditional love is one of the three threads in this braid. The next is that we love God or our higher power or the universe, whatever our word may be, within or without a faith tradition, but that there is a powerful love, a transcendent love, where we feel the presence of spirit or ultimate force of love in every day of life. And as we feel that, the third strain in the braid is that we share that we express that so that we tell our children this is real this counts there's a word for it and whether that word is you see life watches over you or you see god or jesus walks with you or you see there is a spirit in life that will always stand by your side in your darkest loneliest moments you are never alone so those three threads, our unconditional love, our own spiritual experience, and that we might share that with our children, weave together a braid that is so strong. That is the cord that our child holds the rest of their life. Now, other people matter too. And, and that is certainly the case, but there is no impact like the impact of a mother. And when we looked at this through the lens of science, when a mother, when we as a mother pass the torch to our children, we don't, you know, make the light, we pass it, right? That child is 80% less likely to have a long-term major depression, the type of depression that just knocks us out. That child is far less likely to become addicted to drugs and alcohol. That child is far more likely to be able to connect in love, build their own spiritual core and become people of contribution. For instance, make a life-changing podcast. So this, this is really who we are as mothers. And I think it's important to know that there is a spiritual call to motherhood. It is the most extraordinary mantle that we assume. And it is not acknowledged quite enough, I think, in mainstream, you know, parenting literature talks a lot about what you feed your child and what time they go to bed and what you should and shouldn't say. But really, Parenting and motherhood is about the spiritual heart and voice that we express every single day. And in that way, our ambassadors of the higher power to our children. So there are a lot of women who come to me, Dr. Miller, and they'll say, um, Julie, what do I do? I don't believe maybe in the dogma of religion. I don't want to take them into a religious institution. Um, but I know that my kids need to hear spiritual language, spiritual information. And yet my partner is really kind of against this because it believes it's too woo woo, would rather kind of bring them into a, a church setting. I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer here, but I guess what I'm wondering is for those who have spouses or partners, who really don't believe in in their their partner doing spiritual work this is the answer behind that right if we take these facts to our partners and say listen this affects our kids when they get older i need to be able to impart this to my child this is the answer i think that we need to be giving our partners in these circumstances right 
Julie, in the awakened brain, I share many, many referenced studies, peer reviewed scientific published studies. You can pull them up on Medline, you can pull them up on Google Scholar. But in the awakened brain is a summary of the science. And the science says in the United States, about if you think of a one big circle, R for religion, and another big circle next to it by the side, overlapping S for spirituality, a Venn diagram, right? In the middle, about two thirds of people in our country will say, I am spiritual and I am religious. So my deep connection, my transcendent relationship to God, Jesus, Allah, Hashem, it is held in my faith tradition. Mm -hmm. About 30% of millennials and more of Gen Z say, I am spiritual, but I am not religious. For me, spirituality is felt in the love of my family, in the felt depth of music as I walk through nature. Whether or not we are religious, we all are born with a natural spiritual core. And that's reflected in MRI studies through the same circuit in our brain, whether we're religious or not religious, we all have the spiritual circuit in our brain. And in the awakened brain, I say, you know, in, in greater detail what these neural correlates are. What's important for every man, woman, and child to know is that we are spiritual beings and we can grow and flourish spiritually within or without of religion. It's up to us. Now, this is something that's very empowering and can be very transforming in our families and in our work to know that Speaking our true spiritual voice from the heart is speaking from a profound, fundamental part of our human condition. This is who we are. It is not woo-woo. It is as important as air and water and the right nutrients that every child get the sunshine of spiritual life from his or her parents. This is core to how we're built. And when we do build up our child's spiritual core, they're healthier, they're happier, they're more able to make friends and stick with things in life. They have more character. Everything goes well when there's a strong spiritual core because it's the hub of the wheel. So we certainly would not want to omit that. We would certainly not want that core to atrophy because the wheel goes wobbly. But if we keep the core strong, no matter what the tire hits, in time, the child lands and rolls forward. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. So one of the other things that you say, and correct me if I get this wrong, but one third of your spirituality um, really comes from like you're born with it, but then two thirds of it is learned. So it really makes the case within your book that we need resources. We need um, spiritual resources in order to build up with that two thirds. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Right. And so the resources come at many levels in our lives. You know, we've spoken some about the power of parents, right? And many parents say to me, okay, I'm not religious, but I am very spiritual. How do I impart that to my children to fill out the two thirds embrace? And the three most important things that a mother or father can do is whatever your practice of transcendence may be, whether it's meditation or gratitude ceremonies or walks in nature, deep prayer, do that out loud and invite your child by your side so that they learn, if you will, the on-ramp to spiritual awareness. The other thing that we can do as parents is be very explicit about the role of spirituality in our life in glorious moments and in painful moments. So you know, we might see a sunset and say, the sunset is so beautiful. And I look at you and your sister and I just know that life is good or that God is good or that spirit made you. I couldn't have done this alone, right? And so too, in difficult times, many people say, you know, it was the most painful time in my life. My child was ill, didn't know if she or he was going to make it, and I couldn't do it alone. So I handed it over. Okay, you handed it over to something real. Yeah. There is a loving, guiding consciousness in and through us, and we are built to know to hand it over and that we will be caught and held. There is built into life a loving, guiding support so that we are never alone. We are always held. And when we look closely, we're always guided. So whether these are joyous times or difficult times, people recovering from addiction say this all the time, that I bottomed out and I knew I had to surrender. 
Well, you weren't surrendering to nothing. You were surrendering to your higher power. And that is real. And again, MRI studies show that we are built to be able to see, perceive, and hand over. And that what we then find is that life opens up and we are held. So parental transparency, praying out loud, meditating by my side, speaking honestly of joyous and painful moments in our relationship to God, or our higher power. And then the third piece is lived spiritual values in relationships. And our children watch us like a hawk. <laughs> they remember things. I, I have three children and they will tell me things that happened 15 years ago. <laughs> Little tiny things I said in passing. <laughs> so, you know, we don't need to be perfect, but we can certainly, you know, use our spiritual voice when we're not perfect to show that things can be renewed and replenished. You know, there's too much out there about, you know, punching people in the nose when things go wrong. And I think we need to show that we can repair things person to person, and then we can repair things with God or a higher power. And I'll give you an example. Um, I could be, you know, three kids in the back seat, mom driving, and we're off to the beach. And we get to the beach and I load everyone out and it's a gorgeous day. We're gonna have this wonderful time. And there's a picnic packed, kids run into the water and I am not there. I am mentally not there. I, and it's not just about being mindful. I'm, I'm worried about, you know, okay, you know, did that check clear? And what did that guy say to me at work? And what's going to happen at work? And, you know, and all these little residual wheels are turning. Well, you know, an hour goes by, the day goes by, we're back in the car. And I realized, you know, I really, I blew it. They had a nice day at the beach, but I wasn't there with them. And so I can say two things. The first is, you know, you guys, I'm sorry that mommy wasn't more available. You know, I realized it was this great day at the beach and you all had fun, but I really wasn't connecting. And I'm sorry, because really you are the most important thing in my life. And second, and I didn't pull over. It's more important than anything else. Pull the call over, pull the car to the side. Will you join me in a moment of prayer or reflection or renewal? Because today was a gift and I feel like I squandered it. And we can fix things with God, fix things with our higher power. You know, thank you, God, for this beautiful day. May I be more present to our higher power, whatever words are yours. And then children learn that anything can be fixed, both one-on-one -on -one with humans, but also with our highest power. There are so many students where I work at Columbia University who come to our Awakened Awareness Spiritual Wellness Program. They've been through trauma and they've been through years of therapy in which it was fixed interpersonally. You know, they worked it out with the parent, they confronted the person, they discussed it. But what wasn't fixed was the deep significance spiritually of this experience. And they come in with what we call spiritual injury. There was a time in their life where they felt closer to God. There was a time in their life where they could meditate or pray and feel the spirit in life. And right now the door is closed. And so it is spiritual renewal that must go hand in hand with our relationships as we fix things. And then children learn that life can always be renewed. That in the deepest sense, we can always be, if you will, made whole. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's just so deep and just so beautiful. Um, and it's all of ours. This is our birthright. Yeah. Yeah. A yeah. hundred percent. Beautiful souls, do you regularly see repeating numbers, cardinals, or other signs? If so, your angels and loved ones on the other side are trying to tell you something. These signs aren't just a cute hello from the universe. These messages go deeper. These messages are about you, your life, your relationships, your purpose, and how God needs to work through you in this lifetime. Friends, we all go through moments where we question, am I doing this right? Am I on the right track? The thing is, our higher self knows the true answer. Our angels and loved ones in heaven do too. I've worked with the angels to channel the steps you can take to uncode your own personal messages and clearly hear answers from the other side. This workshop will give you your own unique way of communicating with your spirit team and leaning on them for support. 
After this workshop, you'll be able to integrate these steps into your life to clearly communicate with your angels daily. This workshop is on Saturday, March 26, 2022 at 10.30 a.m. Central Time. It's called Signs and Angel Numbers, a divine guide to clearly understanding your angels. If you're an angel member, this workshop is included in your membership. Non-members can register for this workshop on my website, theangelmedium.com. And if you're listening to this in the future, you can also check it out on the website as well. You talk about signs, right? And if you're open to signs, you get more. And scientifically, if you're closed off to signs, you get less. Why is this? Yes, we are built to see into a living universe, to see that we are loved and held, that we are never alone, and that we are guided. We literally shift our attention network from the top down bowling alley. Got to have what I planned. It had to be that red door. I mean, I got A plus B plus C ready. And what? I don't get that permission. What? He doesn't want to marry me. What? We just lost that house. You know, everything was lined up and that door was stuck. And it was the thing that I wanted, 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 almost in, as we look in the MRIs, a stance of I've got to have it and addiction, right? <sighs> that through a spiritual engagement, through a prayer, a connection to our higher power, that top-down narrow pursuit drops and expands. And we open to a much bigger world in which there's far more beauty and opportunity and the yellow door pops. Many people say when we move from the top-down dorsal to the bottom of ventral attention network, the bright possibility pops. And I would have told you there wasn't even a yellow door on earth, but there I meet my best friend or the fellow I do marry or a whole new line of work that was so much more right for me. And I didn't even know it because all I had was the information from today going backwards. But what inspiration and God's guidance brings is what comes forward. Mm. And what does that open up in our brain when we are open to that forward possibility, all of the good coming into our life, when we see these signs? Because you talk about in your book, I love the story of the teen girl who's coming to see you and her dad's passed away. And you can just, you know, you're, you want so much as a healer yourself to like pull her out of this sadness, this deep, deep sadness that she's in. Um, but then this beautiful like angel story story unfolds where she goes to this dance, meets a boy who um, has the same name as her father and just knows like she knows, like she knows, like she knows that that her dad sent her this young man and everything starts to shift in her life. She starts to come back. She starts to open up. Why does that happen? So that is perhaps the most important story in the book. And I can see, Julie, what a deep, loving, and wise healer you are. Okay. Suffering through the lens of science, through MRI studies, suffering is a knock at the door for a deepening of spiritual life. When we look at MRI studies and we look at people who recover from their darkest, most painful, isolated moment, and these are harsh moments. And they might have gotten there with a very bad event that is legitimately plunging, right? The way out is always this attention, this perception, this capacity to be in relationship with spirit, God, in and through, oftentimes, what I might call trail angels, right? The people, the helpers and the healers who come our way, the signs... The universe is very much alive. We are not treading on, you know, an inert dead stage, making our own stories, creating our path. We are discoverers of our journey and we are in deep dialogue. So the question to ask if I'm really stuck is, okay, I'm miserable. I'm locking myself into my deepest, isolated, most lonely place. But what is life showing me now? What is life telling me now? And if we can start to look at life as connected, full of trail angels, people who tell us exactly what we need to know, books that fall in our lap, friendships, whether they're friendships of 10 years or friendships of two days, 
that come to us at just the right moment. These are our deep relationship, our dynamic dialogue with life. This is our dynamic dialogue with life. So let me tell you in the story, in the awakened brain of that young woman, she had literally barricaded herself in her room. She was in such mourning over her father's death and in such despair about having to then move in with a very walled off, very angry, pained, suffering, walled off relative that she literally put a dresser against her door. And because she was you know, not allowed to date, she would sit in her room and wonder what boys might be like. She'd cut them out of People magazine and make big collages <laughs> and bring in these posters. You know, he looks so nice pointing to a Jonas brother, you know, <laughs> and she wondered what boys were like. And so that she should have been allowed finally by her very authoritative relatives to attend a dance, very well chaperoned. And suddenly a man, a boy, young, came up with her father's name, a very unusual name. We'll call it Horatio. She said to me, don't you see, Dr. Miller, my father sent him. My father is looking out after me. And then her pain parted and then her despair fell because she knew that her father still protected her. She knew that she would never be alone, that she had a transcendent relationship to her father. And she went for months of really not getting better to renewal. Now, there'd be hard days, of course, but she'd been renewed. She went from one to 10, sloshing around a four, a five, a four, to eight, nine, 10, eight, nine, 10. She was up amongst the world of the living. And because the world of the living includes our ancestors, our higher power, the spirit that is right here in all of us that walk around on earth, it includes the deeper nature of life. It includes the, our transcendent relationships. And when we see God in one another or spirit in one another, and when we feel in relationship to our higher power, the world is about 10, no, I would say a thousand fold larger. And the possibilities are so much more infinite. Which is Crazy because you also talk about, and I didn't see it this way until you mentioned it in your book. And I've been kind of saying it's almost like, um, I forget exactly how you phrased it, but if a scientist went in to study physical light, actual light, and they saw that light is waves, and then they went back to check it and they saw that light is particles. So they went in again and they saw that when you put your attention on light, it moves from a wave state to a particle state. And I hope that what people understand that what Dr. Miller just said is that when you're open to signs, when you're open to God, universe, source coming in, you're actually open to the infinite possibilities that the universe has in front of you. And your future, your possibilities are so much more grand, so much more big in front of you. And then you can choose of your free will what you want to put your attention on, how you want to move forward. And in doing so, transmute those waves into particles and bring it into a co-creation state in your life, right? We are points and we are waves. We are both. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you put that so beautifully. You can almost feel it. Well, I think you can feel yeah. it in yourself. That sense when you're trying to discern, you know, from a wave state in your heart, you know, from a field of possibilities, from where do I go? What is what is life showing me? Where is source pointing me? Where there's a dialogue. And then when you hit it, boom, you can feel it collapse. Collapse in a positive say. You can see it converge. Yeah. Um, and that resonance you can feel in your body. That is a very powerful moment in which we are in dialogue with the infinite universe. We are made of the universe. We're like rays of the sun, emanations of the universe, and we are in dialogue. And when we have these moments where we feel, where is source guiding me? Where am I? And this is right. This feels right. This hits the resonance of my inner compass. There's that sense of convergence, yeah. right? And the, and the tension and the wondering converges. And that's a very different process than making a laundry list and weighing out the pros and cons. It is a deeply resonant inner intuitive 
transcendent process. It is not made out of what I call, you know, the tactical, strategical, I call achieving awareness added up piece. We need that in life, but it is insufficient on its own to make the big decisions. And the more we make decisions from our deep awakened awareness, our spiritual knowing, our birthright, the more aligned they are with our true journey and the more infinite the world opens up for us. You know, I didn't read this in your book, but I think I saw it in another interview that you did. You call it an awakened decision, which I just love the name of that. And I think I heard you say, you know, as women, and we talk about, you know, the grand feminine rising, um, we, we really see that women's first fight was for like the right to vote. Our second fight was for the fight to be able to work. And really the way that the grand feminine is rising is the third fight is the fight for the awakened decision to not make those decisions from your achieving brain. What I should do, I should be doing this. I should be doing that. But really from this place of an awakened state, um, talk more about that. And indeed, while awakened decisions are available to men and women, women lead our lives this way. So the most important decision, and we can invite you know, your community, the most important decision that you ever made, how did you make it? And how did you know, really know, whether it was you know, to choose a partner or carry a child or move someplace, an important decision that changed the whole trajectory of your life. Where did that come from? And most women would say, I just knew. I just knew. And I'll share with you some stories. Um, there was a woman I know who had uh, tried for years and years and years and years to get pregnant. And finally she did. And she went in and she got her third checkup, this was sort of you know, along the path. And the news she got back was that there is an X percent chance this child will be compromised with this disorder and a Y percent chance, which was quite significant, that the child will be compromised with another disorder. Now, in her deep, deep instinct, she knew the child was fine. She knew it. So she took both pieces of data home to her spouse. And she said, I've had an incredibly painful day. I went into the doctor. The doctor said this child is very likely to be compromised at a very high percentage. But I just know, on the other hand, that this child is fine. And he said, well, let's get another opinion. So they went to the expert of experts and they traveled 400 miles and they went to the expert of experts and all the tests were run again. And then she sits down with the doctor, a woman who says, we've run the numbers again. Um, the numbers are the same. You know, there, there's a very significant chance that your child will, will struggle. But then there's something I want you to know. And to this day, it moves me because this is a woman trusting awakened decisions at a critical moment professionally. The female doctor said, I want you to know. And she put the paper aside that I've done this for 15 years. And it's been my experience that when a woman knows in her heart that the child is fine, the child has been fine. And when a woman just has this feeling things aren't right, no matter what the numbers say, there's been a challenge. So I just want you to know that and that you do have a form of knowing. So this, she chose to carry the child. The child was healthy. Wow. Okay. Who relied on awakened decisions. Who made awakened choices? Well, the mother, right? Her partner, the father, he said, I'm going to hand this to you. I'm going to defer to you because you have a deep form of knowing that I have witnessed in our lives and in our marriage. And the doctor, everyone in that story trusted in awakened decisions, the deeper part of ourself that knows what's true. It could be intuition. It could come through a mystical experience, hearing or knowing something in our mind's eye. It could come through a dream. This is real. This is the most powerful information and they're the most powerful and important moments in our lives. And I can tell you that when we trust these, everything unfolds in a much more splendid and radiant way. Now I have in my life both trusted and at moments erred in not trusting 
awaken decisions. And when I do, I see this beautiful opening up and it's with awe and gratitude. And when I haven't, it's been to my own peril and those around me. Now it's a journey and we can regroup and we can renew and go forward and learn. But awaken decisions use a form of knowing with which we are hardwired and that allows possibility to open up beyond all the added up laundry list numbers that we could concoct. When women use our voice and take our deepest form of knowing to work, to education, to podcasts, to the public square, we are moving the needle. We're shifting the conversation for society and we need this dearly. The 20th century was wrecked with damage of splintered identities in this country versus that country. But knowing in a deeper way that we're one field of life, one family, and knowing in a deeper way, there's a form of intuitive knowing that catches the infinite. And it's almost like a catch in a baseball mat. Now, over time, that catch will unfold and we can discern all of the information in that catch. But that catch, that gut feeling, that just knowing, that dream, that mystical experience, that catch is the best knowledge that we could possibly have. It is, it is not certain. It is absolutely certain. And over time, its implications will unfold yeah. and untangle. And that catch, I just want to explain to everybody listening, there's a moment where you feel, and in our language, we say, you know, alignment, this resonance, this flow, this aha, you know, it. Um, what Oprah calls like her aha moments, right? Um, it's this moment where you just know, and it all clicks together. And what I tell a lot of people that I work with is until you have that, you don't have your answer. And it's okay to wait until you do, because because that is the answer. And if you don't have the answer just yet, you don't have all of the pieces. And it's also possible that you feel the landing, you know, wow, that's the click. But all that it will imply, who you will meet and what you will do and how this in five months, five years will unfold is yet to unfold in linear time before our eyes. So we need to trust our knowing and trust the deep goodness in and through life, spirit, source that guides us and honor those gifts. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, I love in your book that you also talk about the power of prayer and you talk about, I don't remember the exact states, but let's say somebody is in Arizona praying for somebody who is in Maryland and they hook the person in Maryland up to these like electrodes, didn't tell this person when they were going to receive prayers, but um, the person in Arizona sent prayers at a certain time. And without even knowing, the person received the prayers and their energy shifted or something happened scientifically. What is that? Oh, it's such a powerful, powerful truth that science finally was able to hold up our scientific mirror and bear witness to. It's absolutely beautiful. If you have a healer in an MRI in Arizona and you have the patient in an MRI in Maryland, what we see is that the healer starts to do her or his work and time and time again, a predictable brain pattern comes up on the MRI screen. Within an instant, the identical brain pattern appears all the way across the country in Maryland. Even though they so don't know it's happening. Yes, correct. So one thing, consciousness, loving, healing consciousness, perhaps it's our dialogue, our lining up, our alignment with source has its material expression in two places. This right one thing, loving presence, healing presence is expressed in and through two brains, two landing stations or docking stations, if you will. So the brain is really a neuro docking station. Certainly we can make thoughts, but we also can receive them. So the brain may even be a materialization of the spirit of consciousness. So the brain is much more than a black box that you turn a, you know, like a jack in the box, turn a, the candle on the outside and boom, there's a thought. It's something like an antenna. It's something like beam me up, Scott, mate, Scotty. It's, it's a realization of, of emerge. And, and, you know, 
neuroscience at the moment has gone so far as to say, yes, consciousness can be in two places at once. It's what Larry Dossi, I think, called very beautifully non-locality of consciousness. Um, often with my students, we call it a consciousness-based reality at Columbia or post-material or beyond just what you can touch and feel. And the idea then that you could be praying for someone and far across the country, they are receiving that prayer and source is in there too, right? We don't have a clear model of how source works, but source is in there. So source is in there too across the country and there's real change. Or you know, mothers say all the time, you know, my, my son or daughter, my son was a soldier in Afghanistan. He was hit. I just knew something was wrong. I sat up in the night. It was 3 a.m. in Chicago and I just knew something was wrong. That is one consciousness. And it is and it is intensified, it is stronger when there's a bond, like between mother and child or two very close friends. The strongest bond happens to be between twins. Wow. That's so beautiful. Well, I wanted you to know that after I read that, um, the way that I do the Thursday episodes, the angel stories, as I just take one day out of the month and I do like eight back to back. Um, so people who are listening to the show, it won't start right away because we had some episodes in front of it. Um, but this spring, you're going to start to hear that we end every single podcast with a prayer. And I've been saying this, like talking about your study, um, Dr. Lee. Lisa Miller and what you found, um, because I want us at the end of ep every episode moving forward to really just spread that love out into mm. the universe and, and to everybody here on the planet. Um, so beautiful. Yes. And you do. It is absolutely reality true. And I'm so glad that finally science can hold up witness a lens to what you already know. Yeah. It's incredible. We're knowers in many forms and yeah. we need all forms of knowing. Okay. So not like you need any messages and I don't bring through anything negative, but I keep feeling this to tell you, um, I feel like you might want a little pause, right? Like a little break, but I feel like you do have this other book that you're going to write and I feel like you're going to keep going. But, um, but if you need to take that break, um, they, they keep saying it's okay to take that break. But then I really see you, um, when I ask spirit, you know, where I'm going to go with this, they've been saying even for God rest her soul, Betty White passed away this year. Um, they keep saying you'll be like the Betty White of the spiritual community, oh, right? And beautiful. they said, pass that over to you as well, um, because your work here in your books, I know is just the anthem for everybody who's on the ground, foot soldiers like me, um, going out and doing this spiritual work in our everyday. It isn't always easy. And it's not always easy to put yourself out there. And there can be a lot of backlash that you get on social media and different places. Um, I really was so inspired when I read The Awakened Brain because it gave me the most solid footing, right, to stand on and say, no, fight back within your own egoic mind when it's yapping away at you. No, this is why we're here. No, this is why we're doing what we're doing. And um, thank you. Thank you for the work that you've done. Thank you for the collaboration and for your leadership and helping to co-create a more spiritually aware world. Yeah. Can we end here with a prayer? Um, Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just all say a little prayer here. I just want all of us to get into that oneness energy, feel your oneness with all things. And today I want to pray for all that are in the medical field right now, all who are wanting to make strides like Dr. Lisa Miller, wanting to prove um, 
and hold up a mirror to spirituality to show everybody how important spiritual work is. Um, this was not easy for Dr. Lisa Miller to do this work. It's not easy for others in the medical field um, because it's not believed 100% by others around them. And so I just want us to send love, God's oneness energy to everybody working in the medical community, the scientific community, to just ask God Universe Source to provide them with the strength, the resilience, and every tool, resource, angel that they need in order to do their work, stand in their power, and bring through more scientific studies like this so that um, medicine and spirituality can continue to fuse together and um, that spirituality can continue to come into this world in a more deepened, impactful way. Thank you so Julie, much. Julie, bless you. Bless you. And blessings to your loving community that you lead. Thank you so much, Dr. Lisa Miller. Um, everybody, we're going to put the show note into the show notes where you can get Dr. Miller's book um, around the web. Dr. Lisa Miller, if people wanted to know more about you, where can they go? Oh, thank you. So lisamillerphd.com is my website. And I'm on Instagram, Dr. Lisa Miller. Um, and it's just such a joy to connect in such a rich and powerful and true way with you, Julie. A real joy. And I hope to see you again. Oh, thank you so much. And we hope to see you again, too. Thank you for your time today. Beautiful souls, I just want us to take a moment and pray together. I want you to start by taking a deep breath in and a deep breath out. And I just want you to feel your crown chakra opening at the top of your head. I want you to feel God's loving oneness energy pouring like a waterfall of love into your entire body, surrounding your auric field, filling every molecule of space within you, surrounding you. And I want you to feel that you are so filled to the brim with oneness energy that it begins to radiate out like the rays of energy that radiate out from the sun. And friends, what I want to do this month is every time you come to the podcast, I want us just to pray together. The reason we pray, we have shown it scientifically, it does make a difference. When you pray, they have shown scientifically that it does something within another person's energy field. That person might not know that they are being prayed for, but something is happening energetically. So let's just come together today and pray. There's a lot happening in the world right now, and this is not about letting fear consume you. This is about taking your energy and directing it the way you want it to go. And so we're going to use our intention today. We're going to use the love that God has just poured into us today to radiate that love out, radiate our intent, prayers, ask God to surround angels with the people on earth who need it. And in particular today, we're going to ask that God surround with angels the people of Ukraine, to provide the people of Ukraine with angels that give them strength, that give them hope, that give them divine wisdom. Friends, this isn't a political thing whatsoever. This is a human thing. This is a collective consciousness thing. And what we're doing today is bringing more love into this world. 
So I want you to just take a moment to pray with me. Dear God, universe source, we know that there are babies that uh, should be in a NICU right now, special needs children who should be in an ICU hospital right now, who are not able to because of the conflict that is happening in Ukraine. And God, we ask you to protect those children, to heal those children, to surround those children with the angels that they need to give them everything, to become fully 110% healthy. God, universe source, we pray for the mothers who are pregnant right now, who are fear-filled of how they're going to give birth where they're going to give birth. We ask you to put their hearts, their minds at ease and create a safe place for them to bear children into this world. God, we pray for the displaced families, the children who are unsure of what's going on, who have fear in their hearts. We pray for those children to be surrounded by angels of comfort, angels of love who fill them up so that they know they're not alone and they feel a semblance of safety, of security. We also play, pray for those displaced families, those who are left behind, those who are still fighting. God, we ask you to give them courage. We ask you to give them strength. We ask you to fill them with every single thing that it is that they need to get through this time in their life. God, Universe Source, we ask you to provide everyone in Ukraine with angels to surround them. God, Universe Source, we also pray for those who have lost somebody in this conflict. That you help bring healing to the hearts of those who are left behind. And friends, I just want you to take a moment to add in your own prayer right here, right now. Friends, your angels ask you to hold a vision of future earth, and that is one filled with peace, with love, where there is all peace on earth. And if your egoic mind comes in, gets in the way and says, that's not possible, Julie, it is. We all have to hold that vision within our minds right now. So start by holding it within yours, by seeing all of earth as peace filled, as loving towards one another. Your angels say that now more than ever, it's so important for you to do your own work on yourself because when you're spiritually healthy individually, it leads to us being spiritually healthy as a collective. So doing the work on yourself individually lends itself to peace within all. When you have peace within you, we can have peace within the collective. So friends, please know that your angels do not want you to be fear-filled. They want you to, anytime your egoic mind brings in fear, use your intention. Use your ability to pray. There is no wrong way to pray. To pray for people you care about, even if you don't know them. Use this opportunity to look at your own life and the lessons that God, universe, source, your angels are trying to bring into you right now on how to bring more peace into your life so that as you create a more peace-filled world for yourself, we can come into a more peace-filled collective as a whole.
Friends, I want you to see one more time peace on earth, peace within yourself, peace within your own life. I want you to send that energy that you are filled with, that oneness energy out to the world, out to the people of Ukraine, out to everyone on this planet who needs it. Remember, it's not coming from you. It's coming through you from God, universe, source. If you allow it to, that oneness energy is an unlimited source that will flow through you to everybody who needs it here on earth. Friends, thank you for coming together. Thank you for praying with me. Thank you for sending love out into the universe. Every single time your egoic mind tries to bring you back into a fear state, I just want you to stop for 30 seconds, call in your angels, and just pray. Just feel that oneness automatically radiating within your body and just send it out into the world to those who need it. Friends, I love you. Spirit loves you. Your angels, your loved ones on the other side, they are looking out for you. They're with you right here, right now. Open up your heart to miracles, to blessings, to this vision of peace filling this world. Bye, friends.